My name is Manuela Veloso, and I am currently on leave from Carnegie Mellon as the Herbert A. Simon University Professor of the School of Computer Science, and I'm recently joined uh, J.P. Morgan as Head of AI Research. So it's actually an interesting story in the sense that I, was, I am an electrical engineer and very kind of math and engineering oriented, but I managed, I mean, I, I got to do a master thesis uh, in Lisbon, in Portugal, on the automation of uh, assembly factory. So we had to uh, put in the computer all sorts of like information about orders and then uh, lists of parts were generated automatically. And that uh, master thesis with these beginnings of computing and, and databases led my interest on, oh my God, we can automate anything. And uh, therefore I started thinking, oh my God, these, uh, uh, this is, computers can be so powerful. So it was not that I cared about science fiction, nothing. It was this moment in which I realized the, how computers could actually help humans. Mm -hmm. Another thing I realized in those days was that uh, a lot of the things that computers were doing or humans were doing were very similar and so I developed also this interest on analogy. So uh, doing intelligence by planning by analogy and that one way or another led me to a PhD uh, in computer science uh, advised by Jaime Carbonell, who had worked on derivation analogy at Carnegie Mellon University. And so it was that path that led me to Carnegie Mellon, where I did my PhD back in the early 90s. Since I actually uh, started this PhD in, uh, in AI, I developed a, a, an understanding that AI is a complex discipline. And uh, through actually the um, inspiration of Alan Newell and uh, Herb Simon and Raj Reddy and Takeo Kanade and my own advisor and Tom Mitchell, I became completely fascinated by the integration of perception, cognition and action as a demonstration of what intelligence could be. And so from very early on, I've been uh, trying to develop for all these years autonomous mobile robots, autonomous executors of plans, autonomous perceivers, autonomous uh, creatures that can uh, merge this capability of processing data in the form of sense data, of thinking about their objectives, and eventually actually executing them. Uh, so my work has always been in these autonomous robots, autonomous mobile robots, and uh, also uh, very early on I was exposed to these robot soccer through actually through one of my students, Peter Stone, and uh, the problem of actually doing these AI as teams in uh, adversarial environments led me to introduce this concept of robot soccer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I actually think that uh, Carnegie Mellon was very, uh, inst for, was very receptive of this uh, new area, while uh, robotics was traditionally much more like a, uh, large robots or even like autonomous robots on the road. Now came this robot soccer with these little robots playing in a team against other teams, other robots, other uh, universities. It, it was really, it has been uh, an amazing journey. And then later on, much later, I became, uh, how do you say, um, f uh, became very interested on the problem of these autonomous robots in environments that were human environments. So not really the aspect of going up to Mars or going down volcanoes, mm -hmm. but the fact what if robots are not in the playing field of robot soccer, which was it's a limited kind of field, a very, a very, deter very specific task, but what if they are in our environments. And we had at Carnegie Mellon a long tradition also through Reed Simmons of having like experience and also uh, museum tour, tour guides with ILA, not much, uh, this concept of having like robots in human environments. It was not new. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I envisioned was that they would move in the environments without any humans following them. So which would like this complete autonomy. And that took a very big step to really not have my students follow the robots in these nine floors of a building. Mm -hmm. 
and in particular became this question that they have limitations and in the and then one day i realized that you know ai and these autonomous robots in particular would never be perfect and so i kind of introduced this concept of symbiotic autonomy, in which these AI systems, in particular our cobot robots, would ask for help. Mm -hmm. And ask for help from people, ask for help from other robots, and ask for help to, by going to the web to understand things. So it, it was a fascinating adventure to have these robots move around. We let them go, and we just know that if by any chance they encounter a door closed, an elevator they have to call, a blocked hallway, that they can really tell a human, press the elevator button, open this door, put something in my basket, get out of the way so I can go. Thank you very much. So it became like these uh, empowering the limited AI agents, AI mobile robots, with the surroundings that included humans, uh, in particular humans. And so that actually led me to understand something that I'm, I think I'm well known now for my optimism with respect to AI, because AI in the future, AI in a society, because I do believe that the challenge is these uh, being smart about understanding this human AI interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's not really about AI taking over, it's not really about humans not having any help, it's really about these AI and humans coexisting. And that has been what I pursue even as of today. And as we do this human AI interaction, I, my, my focus is always on the AI side to make sure that the AI side embraces the, pro I mean, the opportunity of having humans around and also services humans and areas of being more transparent became now part of like how do you include values, transparency, explanations into the algorithmic nature of, the, the, of what runs in, on these AI systems. So it was not just the mobile robots, it's in general an AI system. And I can tell you one thing that I feel very strongly about, which is we in computer science in AI have been using algorithms to solve a problem. What's the shortest path? And we would generate the shortest path. What's the next value? And we would make a prediction. And through machine learning, through anything, we, are being, we have been like problem solvers, mm -hmm. but not our code doesn't explain why this is a solution. So we don't write algorithms to say, yeah, this is the best chess, the move in chess, because I mean, I did this off a better search and uh, I looked at these many alternatives. We have never been in the because business. Mm -hmm. We have not been. We have been in the problem solving business, in the solution generation business, which has been a phenomenal kind of like a uh, challenge. But it's almost as this human AI interaction puts us now from an AI point of view, from an algorithmic point of view, in ha ha, hold on a second. Someone might ask you, why are you telling you cannot have a loan? Why are you telling you have to take this medicine? Why are you telling you that you have to pay this insurance? Why are you telling me that to stay in this hotel? I mean, any decision that now AI systems can help we, humans with is a potential for a question mm -hmm. from a human, why, or what if that, or why not that? And our algorithms, and this is where my uh, human AI interaction is always, f um, in some sense, focus on the AI side. Our algorithms are not ready. And we are trying to devise from our cryptic algorithmic kind of like uh, levels and levels of uh, backprop on some kind of neural net, really why did this thing learn? Yeah. Or even like some search algorithm, why did you find this? Was it finding a needle in a haystack? Or all the solutions were all about the same and you are choosing these as a random choice between equally good solutions. So there is so much that the computer and the machine and the algorithm and the AI system knows, which is not pulled out by our current programming technology. So that's what I believe that, so this is a very deep area of interest for me, mm -hmm. and I think it will make AI be amazing if we change this paradigm to be more open mm -hmm. for, uh, because it's there in the algorithm, it's mm -hmm. not that it's not there. And uh, so it's more open for, sharing what's going on inside of these algorithms. I'm curious about the, um, 
the translation of the work that you were doing in regards to robo soccer uh -huh. to this because one of the things that I've always found striking about um, I was familiar with students participating as undergraduate researchers in your lab and the ways in which they would discuss the parameters of the game, mm -hmm. soccer, which have very specific rules, analogous to other games like chess, but also the element of decision making that when people are playing are oftentimes ascribed to creativity and play, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't have a coach calling plays in, mm -hmm. in a human game in the ways that um, you would perhaps in American football or in, in mm -hmm. elements of basketball. Um, but this this idea in your current work on um, opening up further transparency in the decision making mm -hmm. processes within the automated mm -hmm. systems, um, the ways in which it sounds to me like there was a the movement from the seemingly static rule based work in the soccer arena that was a relatively closed system but still open to elements of not chance but but various decisions. Do I chip it? Do I not chip it? By, by virtue of the play, and this notion of collaboration between the robots as well in this team environment. I'm wondering if, if you can speak a little bit about the translation of some of the findings or translation of some of that work that led you to this current work in terms of the transparency of decision making and, and these curiosities. Uh, a lot of the challenges of, uh, of such autonomous system is the uncertainty about what the adversary is going to do. Yes. And it's something that we have not been very, how do you say, successful in modeling necessarily because these robots all do whatever. It's not that it's really humans playing that yeah. might have a strategy, might have a coach, might have some kind of past games you can learn from. So there is a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. and we have always a lot of uncertainty and we have always played these games or these type of strategies in a very kind of beautiful way. We introduced a, a problem, uh, we introduced a playbook which was very, very, very large and basically these uh, these robots uh, stochastically choose between different plays as a function of really like outcomes of past choices. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is uh, that kind of like adaptation, stochastic adaptation. Uh, the, the thing that I want to just say about robot soccer, in fact, that I find it uh, very fascinating now, it's like... Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking that, after all, robot soccer is only a game and uh, the real world is different and AlphaGo is only a game and uh, or Go is only a game. Always this kind of separation. Oh, the real world is much more complicated. These are always games with some rules and so forth. However, I think that the future of AI one day will include, I mean, or the future, will include humans practicing with AI systems. Everybody plays with chess programs now. Mm -hmm. Everybody now, one day people will actually play with soccer teams of robots mm -hmm. to practice. Or for example, I love playing squash, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, unless someone is ready at the same time that I am, I'm not going to have a chance to play squash unless I want just to practice my rails. But that's not really very exciting. Mm -hmm. If there were robots available, you know, to play squash with you, this whole paradigm would change, or tennis, or any kind of other, un, other sports. So I actually value a lot, even if I would start now my career, maybe I would have like developed like these sports playing robots. Mm -hmm. Because even like uh, when you want to practice, I mean, it's not that it's just this tennis ball going, maybe left, right, but not having any intelligence. Technical, what about yeah. playing with an intelligent, tennis play a robot. Mm -hmm. So one day maybe some industry will find that it's really an interesting domain for AI, for robots, not just the, the thinking kind of AI systems like chess or eventually Go or checkers or backgammon or whatever it is, but the physical aspect. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be very nice one day to have actually robots that play soccer, not in necessarily to beat the human player, but to practice with them. And again, the same, but with intelligence, not just machines that uh, just challenge you without thinking. Personalization, adaptation, all sorts of like, um, uh, so I do think that that's an area, like we humans play sports and we also work and we also cook and we also 
take vacations. I think that humans know very well the difference between how they think as they play sports from what they do in their work. I think that that will exist forever. And AI, this human AI interaction I'm talking about in some sense, covers more of the life of people, the decisions they make, not really only the sports they play, which is a separate kind of area. Mm -hmm. I want to emphasize one more thing with respect to AI, which I think that it's important to understand. Unfortunately, people sometimes think AI is machine learning. And uh, machine learning and AI seems to be used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. But that is something that it would be good to understand. From my point of view, machine learning is one of the components of AI. Mm -hmm. AI is a, a science of putting together components, the vision, the planning, the searching, the machine learning, the interaction with humans, and trying to make the whole loop closed so that something can be performed intelligently by an AI system. That's one thing that I feel very strongly about. The other thing is that AI is not a one-shot business. AI is a science that, uh, you know, you, our robots, our cobot robots, they learn by interacting with people uh, about, like, or by going to the web, and they know much more now than they used to know you know, two years ago or three years ago. So, the, unfortunately, in our technology, I say this many times in my talks, we do not, we are not used to buying technology that does not work. We buy a refrigerator and it works. <laughs> we buy a car and it works. We buy a, a vacuum cleaner and it works. Everything works. It's a, a, an unfortunate situation from an AI point of view because we don't see anything getting better by interacting with us. The refrigerator doesn't get better. I mean, we always freeze. There is a little control we can manually change, but there is not this, the sense that I can I see the thing grow as I put more vegetables here, more eggs there. Nothing gets yeah. better in the refrigerating system. A car, the same thing. Maybe the, the seat adjusts your height, and maybe, but that's it. There is not, nothing gets better. Mm -hmm. AI it's going to be a technology that people will be able to use and they have to get used to the fact that maybe the AI system today, based on the current data, makes the wrong decisions, make the wrong advice. But if we have a real AI system, we can give feedback and maybe tomorrow it will do better. We can give instruction, we can interact with that thing in a very kind of like an incremental way. And expecting that an AI system today, who makes decisions about loans, no loans, uh, uh, whatever decisions, makes the right decision on day one, is a mistake. Or the subtlety of that notion of a iterative system yes. that is likely, yes. more likely than less likely to fail initially, yes. but has the capacity to yes. build out its, its capacities yes. further. We have never experienced a human discovery, a human technological discovery, be it the will, be it like whatever it has been in the past, in which when we actually interact with such discovery, there is a process of your own input, your own interaction with the thing, with the technology, uh, the, the, the technology, so that you have an input and you have a say on where the technology goes from interacting with you. So I call these, these aspects that uh, I find very uh, important about learning from experience. So, and it's not probably just a reinforcement learning system, but it's something that you can instruct, you can give feedback, you can f make it forget things, you can make like them biased towards some sides. You might want not to just just use the data. I want to give you a principle. I want to add something. We are in the infancy of understanding how our algorithms are going to be so uh, robust and so verified to be in this interaction. So, you know, in summary, in fact, the challenge here is this human AI interaction and throwing into society. Uh, so artificial creature, creatures, these AI systems, which are not dogs, they are not cats, they are not people, they are these AI things. However, they are intelligent. And they are intelligent. And they are part of what we actually want to use to improve humanity. And just one final thought. People kind of like think, I mean, do we really need AI? And why, I mean, is, should we stop AI? Should we grow AI? I mean, 
two things. First of all, we cannot control AI like that, because AI is something that anyone that has a computer, one way or another, which is pervasive, it's not a special device. Computing. This is a natural path of computing going forward. Mm -hmm. So it's not really easy to just put rules. That what we should invest is on educating people to use these tools well. But it's not really something that it's very easy to just control. But the other aspect also of this AI revolution in some sense is that it is incremental. And it's not that also one day we are going to wake up and AI is there. No. It's every day there is something else. Every day we type an email and there is completion. Every day we go to some website and there is one more way to be smart about the way you do some reservation. It's, 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 so, it's fascinating to witness how 2018 is at the end of 2018, at the beginning. How many more apps we have on our phone? How many more data? And the third thing that is actually inevitable is like this. Think about humanity. What did we became experts on? We are became experts of producing data. Everything we do now is digitalized. Our Fitbits, our credit cards, our conversations, our pictures. I mean, what is not available in a digital form? As soon as we make all these available in the digital form, there are two things we should realize. First of all, no way humans are going to be able to themselves process all that information. What? We put like humans looking at all, everything that we create. Even we know that ourselves, when we take 3,000 pictures on your iPhone, you struggle to find the one you want. Yeah. And you basically, thank goodness, they are linearly ordering time. Mm -hmm. And you know, this was in 2016. <laughs> and there you go down and you reduce your search. But I'm just telling you, imagine images of some city, or imagine the images of some scene, or imagine the images of some hurricane. I mean, there are humongous amounts of data. So AI is because we actually need AI at the same time that we do all this data producers. Mm -hmm. our, our devices produce data and we cannot process that data without the development of these AI systems that can in potentially assist humans and definitely tremendously benefit the support for human decision, the support for human interactions, the support for human beings to actually make advances in our societies. I'm extremely happy, and we are all at Carnegie Mellon, with this new undergrad degree in AI. Mm -hmm. So we kind of like acknowledge that, of course, this is part of the computer science discipline, but it has a, a, an entity of its own. Because now it's not just about having computers do beautiful programming, having computers have excellent algorithms, having computers have great hardware, great operating systems. It's this concept of how do we make all these things intelligent? Mm. And this AI feature that requires students to basically learn not only the algorithm, but also the ethics of having these be part of society. It's just, it's like creating a generation. We are starting to create generations where we want to, them to understand about the power of computers to be intelligent. Not the power of computers to process data very fast only. It's these other, other aspect. And I actually think that one of the most exciting things happening at Carnegie Mellon has to do with this AI major. And we, faculty in AI, to realize, oh my god, this is our chance to educate these generations along the lines of all the way from the technical, mathematical, statistical aspects of computing and the societal aspects. Mm -hmm. So our major includes as a required course, ethics, which we may even like uh, uh, one day even like, uh, you know, revise it and refine it to be ethics in AI and all sorts of ethics in computing, ethics uh, about multiple cultures. We keep like, we are going to grow that area because that's what AI needs to face, is that it has to go to the world and do it. At the same time that also I think something very beautiful about the AI major is that it's very much also project based. So AI it's also something that's not so general. You need to think about projects, you need to develop problems and try to solve them in an efficient, intelligent, novel way, but a problem. So we have project based courses, a project based uh, courses we have 
capstones if needed. We have ethics. We have all the math, all the science, all the engineering, all the actual uh, statistics, all the tools needed. But we have a different view of what they are going to come out. So I think undergrads, master's students, master's and PhD, we already had a lot of AI. Uh, kind of research. Mm -hmm. But at the undergraduate level to embrace this AI is really a discipline, uh, a new area, is, is really fascinating. And uh, I think that that's one of the greatest contributions of the faculty at Carnegie Mellon is to put AI as a, an education area within our societies. Unfortunately or fortunately, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have yet is that we don't have many robots around. Mm. Mm -hmm. We don't have physical robots. Yeah. I think people got used to their cell phones, they got used to their Google search, they got used to their email, they got used to all these digital tools, and they are happy to see them becoming smarter and smarter, from Alexis to all the way to uh, completions of emails. But you see, there are no robots moving around anywhere. Yeah, very uh, little embodiment. And there aren't, there aren't. I mean, there is that Carnegie Mellon, the cobots, there are some somewhere. There. I mean, it's not, I mean, I came all the way from the airport, I'm in New York, and I basically, you don't see any robot anywhere. <laughs> so you are expecting to see the robots, but where are they? Yeah. So I think that the same, so one day, there will be some discussions about this aspect. I foresee that they need to be around. I mean, it's not only the cyber world that becomes intelligent. I think our handling of the physical space, be it for disaster rescue, be it for construction, be it for uh, all sorts of like uh, other needs that we have in the physical space, will come one day. I just think that people are not as ready or are not as prepared but I am, I mean, in the sense that I've been like trying to leave Cobot move around alone so that people see the thing moving. And I usually, I tell you, every time I give a talk to the general public, I usually give them as a homework. Everybody knows, buy a Roomba. <laughs> I always say this because the Cobots are not available for sale. Uh -huh. The Roombas are, and it's not because I have a special interest, but I love the Roombas. And the reason is Alexis, I also love Alexis, but the Roombas move by themselves. Mm. I think it's fundamental for people to start seeing something that moves by itself and you know what happens? Turns, disappears from your sight and it's gone. So you see it's gone. its capability but also its limitations. But no, you home. see that it's not, that it's on its own. Mm -hmm. You see that there will be intelligence that you cannot just have in your pocket like yeah, a cell phone. Right, okay. It just goes. Mm -hmm. And that's the experience, for example, with Cobot. I mean, I mean, I I really tell you that it was a major experience, a major feeling, when that thing went all the way down my corridor, on the way to the lab, and disappeared, turned right, and I felt like following it, you know, going all the way. And where is it? Where is it? And then I could still hear it had this noise of the motors. Blah, blah, blah. I could still hear, and then nothing, no see, no hear, <laughs> and I immediately go and grab the phone. Joy Deep, hey, did the robot arrive to the lab? <laughs> When we are like panicking, where is this thing that moves by itself mm -hmm. and it's on its own without anybody behind and uh, you know, you could go to the web and check where it is. In those days, we didn't have it connected yet to the web. So we literally did not know where that thing was, <laughs> but the fact it was, it, it went. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, you know, it was another, you, you needed to adapt to this thing of seeing things move by themselves. Mm -hmm. And I really think that AI will get to that point. I mean, inevitably, people will have to acknowledge whether it's autonomous cars, whether it's autonomous robots in our human environment, mm -hmm. whether it's drones flying in the sky, that they are moving by themselves, making decisions that eventually humans gave them destinations, or, but it's still that motion, the physical space being, uh, being navigated by autonomous robots. I have a big... Uh, a dream that this will happen one day, that you really enter this uh, airport or you enter this um, you know, shopping center and there are these things that are not people, not dogs, not cats, but there are these mobile robots. And I tell you another thing that you think, I mean I'm sure that many people in robotics feel this way, I, there is not a single day that I enter these Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or any place and I don't think 
why don't these shopping cars move by, move by themselves? Why do I have to push these things? They have wheels, I have a cell phone they can connect with me, I could log in and that thing follow me wherever I go in this store. Why do I have to push that thing? I don't know. Why do I have to push my suitcase? I don't know. Everything that has wheels, in some sense, could really be traversing the space mm -hmm. uh, by themselves. There is no reason for me not to send my suitcase, go to the gate, I'll be joining you right now, right? <laughs> I'll be there in a second. Yeah. You know, so, I am at that level because of all my mobile robot levels, sure. so I care about the web, I care about all the apps, but I cannot wait that something at that level mm -hmm. will eventually one day be also part of our AI conversations. Uh, I find it really interesting that rather than being influenced by science fiction, which many mm -hmm. technologists have described as yes. influence, that you um, pointed to your work in engineering in this master's yes. thesis. And also this idea of, of the cart that follows you or the suitcase that leads towards uh, your gate at the airport. And we don't, you know, by and large use porters often anymore to move our luggage necessarily. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, a self-driven economy. We have been questioned about AI taking jobs for a you know, for sure. several months or for yeah. several years. Yeah. And I finally came to resolving in my head what's going to happen. Mm. You know, especially also with my experience at JP Morgan and understanding the real world. You know what? I think it's going to be humans that require these tasks to be done by AI. It's not AI. It's going to be humans that are going to say, I don't want to be writing all these numbers in this Excel page by myself. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be answering phones asking what is my balance or something. Why not have computers do it for me? It's going to be the same way that how would you feel that if I tell you rent this place, there are no washer and dryers in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You have to wash everything by hand. Mm -hmm. You are going to say, come on, give me a break. Why am I supposed to do something that I know machines can do? Mm -hmm. Why am I supposed to go to a place that doesn't have any dishwashers? Or why am I supposed to go to a place in which to connect phone calls? I have to, have it to be in a switchboard. You start realizing, and humans are amazing, at realizing the things that actually, you know, AI is going to be able to do it for you. It's like me when I ask, like I have to do the bibliography search for some kind of topic. And I'm, I resent the fact that there is nothing that I say, tell me everything <laughs> that is, is talked about this particular topic, mm -hmm. and have an AI assistant that really goes and mines all this data, yeah. versus me like going and trying to find all the papers, and then I'll miss some for sure. So look at the doctor, look at the lawyer, look at the professional. When are we going to not want to have an AI system that look at all the cases of these diseases in the world and compare with this problem and advise me of what to do? So that's the point. There will be not AI taking over jobs. It's people requesting that AI do the tasks that they find can be actually done by machines. So if I understand correctly, you really see it as this symbiotic relationship yes. that empowers people Empowers people to identify the tools, perhaps a retrieval yes. system. Yeah, and they might dream of things that we as technologists cannot do yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might be dreaming, I wish this thing happened, and it might not be the case. But they might also dream of things that we actually can do, and that we actually uh, will, mm, you know, will advance because of the requests of humankind to be able, again, to close this loop, to be able to process this tremendous amount of data that they know exists, but they also know, humans know, they cannot uh, uh, do this. And then let me just add one thing, and the people keep mentioning, what about like the, the, the uh, jobs like cleaning bathrooms, making the, uh, the, the service jobs? Service jobs. Mm -hmm. You know what? Why? Don't we invent a self-cleaning ba self bathroom? Why do we have to keep those jobs alive? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe people are going to say, you technologists, I don't want to do these jobs anymore. Do you anticipate Chen that need being, if, if by virtue of that need being met, yes. let's say the self-cleaning bathroom, yes. do you imagine these that that will lead to emergence of other, other jobs. industries? Like other industries, the yes, or, the self -cleaning exactly. bathroom, or a designer, or a constructor, okay. or a, you know, it, just think about the transition from the, te the telephone operators to the electronic switch. Sure. When all these people became something else. Mm -hmm. 
So what I'm trying to say is like this. What about humanity looking at this AI as the chance they have to actually free them from the tasks they don't want to do? Mm -hmm. Because it's not that everybody uh, has good jobs in the sense of like loving to do what they, they do. Mm -hmm. They are jobs that are really hard and probably AI can even help with those. AI, robotics, who knows? And maybe we will converse to a society of an economy of talents in which people in fact shine in the things that they want to do and they might even like jump around and do different things and reinvent themselves because we also get tired of doing the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. So even if we love what we do, you know, when I was teaching here, I mean, I wouldn't mind a robot in the morning to use a tent to just go, <laughs> go and teach instead of me today. I don't feel good today. I didn't sleep last night. I was too busy. Do it. Oh, fantastic. I can yeah. teach all the others. But this time, or for example, gardening. I mean, we have to, or shovel snow. It's fine to do it once, twice. Every day, it becomes a little bit less appealing. Yeah. So we may want to have this concept of, oh, I wish there was like some robot that would help yeah. here. You know, it's this, this thing that you, it's not going to take what we like to do as fun. And we still can do it. It's like uh, Herb Simon used to say, when Kasparov lo uh, lost to Deep Blue, it's not that all the people stopped playing chess. People still like to do it. So I think that, I don't know, maybe like someone told me one day, Man Valley, we're very optimistic, which is true, but it's, you have also, uh, uh, you know, there is this concept of being realistic optimistic, and maybe I fail a little bit there, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, my realism is that, in some sense, I believe there is a transition between uh, the telephone operators that were jobless one day and AI can make people out of jobs, but I see it more of a transition and I think that somehow governments and companies have to be responsible financially mm -hmm. for re-educating these these uh, people in the same way that we AI are actually providing tools with online learning, with all sorts of like uh, uh, social networks, all abilities to search online for jobs. Is, uh, I mean, these are all tools created by the, by the technology itself too. So, so I'm realistic, but I think that uh, we are in the right path. So that's why I'm optimistic is because we are trying to help society along many dimensions. It's a good question. I'm not as sure about uh, these um, possible negative interactions with uh, humans, but I tell you one thing though. How many of us now look at the sky to know what's the weather like? We have weather.com mm -hmm. and we became weather.com users. Mm -hmm. And we became, I mean, you know, I'm from Portugal. Yes. I spent, I remember my summers as a child with these fishermen and we would actually go to the beach to ask, what's the weather like tomorrow? Yes. And they would look at the Perfect. horizon <laughs> and like how pink it was yes. and uh, whatever the fog was and they were excellent predictors. That skill is gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked them if it was going to be gone, but it's gone. I have a little bit of it because I learned still. But my kids, they don't know. They never interacted with those fishermen that really predicted this weather beautifully. So you see a lot of these things that unfortunately, or fortunately, or how it, things goes, that our technology had the, has, a, uh, you know, has removed skills from people. So for example, we do not do square roots by hand anymore also. I can still do it. I teach my, even my grandson I'm trying to yes. teach. He's very young. But uh, uh, this thing, square roots by hand. My father knows how to use also his rule slider and all. So it's normal. So we have to just accept that this technology also did not fall from the sky. It was invented by us. So we keep inventing technology. Our, our children, our neighbors, our, uh, all, all, all our people are all creators of new technology. And when new technology comes, 
probably the override skills. I mean, that's, that's the way it kind of has been throughout history. And we don't, we don't eat with our hands anymore, necessarily. Whoa, whoa, you could say, how come someone invented a fork and a knife? I mean, that's not fair. We were supposed to use our hands. Well, guess what? Yeah. The moment the fork and the knife are there, done with the hands, mm -hmm. right? So, and think about also like uh, in the 1400s when Gutenberg in, uh, invented the printing press, reading became a skill taught in the schools. There was not reading before the actual Gutenberg. Mm -hmm. Gutenberg invented Is this kind of like, books and then to books, to read. yes. And then reading and writing became something that was actually a product of Gutenberg's technology, not just the monks, yeah. not just the scientists. It's, it's beautiful. And again, I think that we are living these days by having computing, AI, uh, all sorts of, 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 of technology of data being so pervasive, in which, in fact, in our schools also, it's a new skill that people have to gain. What is all this data about? What is all this computing about? That's, they don't, we did not all become Shakespeare. I mean, even if we learn to read and write, some become Shakespeare and some are not. Mm -hmm. Same thing, we have to teach these kids, this tool, this ability to handle data and computing and so forth. Doesn't mean that they all become computer scientists and AI researchers or AI developers, but still, it became part of the life of people. So I really think that it's a technology kind of like, a technological kind of revolution that is very beautiful, uh, very normal within the path. This, it's going within the path of computing. I mean, we cannot go back and tell Alan Turing, that's it, no. Or for Norman, no, don't make this machine. We can't. We can just not go back. Or tell our Simon, don't think that machines will do things like human problem solving. No. It's, it's there. It's there. It's like electricity. Imagine saying, no, everybody now uses candles. Yeah. No more like, uh, at least even like gas but no, I mean, or oil, but no electricity. So it's kind of like uh, people should appreciate it, I mean, in a sense, and try to make the best out of it to improve our humanity. So it's, we are in just in that beautiful kind of 21st century, beginning of 21st century moment. But, you know, 100 years from now, it will look like what horses and airplanes or mm -hmm. something looked to us now. So very good question. I, I really think uh, that uh, the, we have created a technology that because of actually this, it's pervasive kind of like a device, which is computing, with all the off-the-shelf things that we are producing, it's actually something that can, uh, uh, that can be used by anyone for any use. So it's, it's, it's uh, how can I say, it's dangerous. But it's as dangerous as making guns available to people or some sure. of that level. Yeah. So I tell you something. I really think that we have to regulate one way or another what becomes public and available. One way, look at this. The pharmaceutical company does not let anyone just come up with their own drug and right. now, you know, CVS can sell it. No, mm -hmm. there's a process. Mm -hmm. There's a process for food. There's a process for drugs, there is a process for quality control of cars, there's a process for everything that is serving society from a technology point of view or from a resource point of view that is eventually checked. It doesn't mean that you cannot have an accident in a car, but it's still the case that it's checked. So I wish that uh, we develop ways of checking if actually the AI products that are being available and made available can be checked one way or another. Mm -hmm. And it's very nice to have these type of discussions because in our research society and research community, there are people that are very much dedicated to study this problem mm -hmm. of verification and proof and checking and quality control and all sorts of like, uh, how do you say, measures mm -hmm. to try to see uh, to try to, uh, to, to have with the least probability arm coming from these tools that AI can produce. So that's really important to push forward. Uh, I think it's a hard uh, problem because while, for example, in pharmaceutical 
research, you have the mice in which you test, you have the people, whatever. It's more constrained uh, in terms of like uh, the target. This AI seems to be overwhelming. I mean, in the sense that it can apply to anything, to elections. It can apply to uh, to actually influence you anywhere. It can apply to the decision support. So it's that's what fear. That's what's more fearful to me is this unboundness of AI. It's the, the you fact to the transparency yes. of processes. Yes, exactly. And perhaps that's a safeguard. Yes, too. and but I do think that the only conclusion I have for all this is that we better become a better humanity, just humans, because harm doesn't come from the technology itself. Harm comes from the bad use of the technology that humans invent. And so if we would just be able to have people live happily and accept their different kind of cultures and accept uh, that the earth needs to be pre preserved and that accepts that there are these enormous inequality that needs to be uh, bridged. I mean, there are so many things that we could invest our efforts on rather than use poorly the technology. So it's a call to humanity, the power of this technology in some sense. We invented it. Now, are we going to be able to live with it? Well, that's a challenge for us. And I, I'm very confident that we actually can address this challenge in a good way.